Hello! Today I wanted to share with you a recording from a library talk titled Second Thoughts, a collective exploration on Eastern Europeanness that I had the pleasure to moderate together with Julia Elias, Tasha Arlova and Eva Machov. The event took place on the 6th of October and was hosted by the Rietfeld Sandberg Library and Radio Rietfeld. All the books we mention in the talk are shortlisted in the show notes of this episode. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome everyone who <laughs> joined us and uh, everyone who is listening to us. So it's actually uh, not just uh, opening of um, yeah, like certain space dedicated in library, but also for us it's kind of celebration since we made this reading group last year and it was like about sharing ideas and about sharing books. And this year we finally can also have a special dedicated place uh, in uh, Ritwet Library. So I'll make a short introduction and uh, then give, uh, so we are four of us here. So we're going to share about uh, books, about ideas behind this uh, group. Uh, and you're also welcome to join conversation. And uh, so a brief story. So last year with Julia, uh, we started a reading group uh, called Post Eastern Soviet Europe. And uh, each of us uh, from the group had different ideas, but it's, um, I, I can share about my experience and why it was important to kind of um, have this space and meet with people. I'm coming from Belarus, uh, so I start, uh, I'm um, here in photography department. And when I came, you know, that's the moment when you start to kind of represent your own country. Uh, so I learned a lot about Belarus <laughs> from uh, feedback from people here. And then, uh, you know, most references were about, uh, yeah, dictatorship. And I felt like as an artist, I'm all constantly working in this framework of coming from a dictatorship country. And, uh, but then, you know, I missed kind of, I had lack of um, sensitivity to the context. And it was important to discuss uh, art and, and research with some people who are interested in same topics. And uh, although we know that kind of this uh, post-Soviet term is problematic, or if we say like Eastern European term, still uh, I think we share uh, similar histories. And um, so we found basically like a group of people who are interested to discussing books and gathering and discussing artworks. Today we're going to introduce some books which are in uh, new collections and also share uh, our plans for this year so you can join more events. So I'll give a uh, word to Julia Ellis who brought a lot of books to our collection and uh, maybe you could give a yeah, uh, introduction to selection of the books. Uh, yeah, so uh, I suggested um, uh, several books for the collection of the library. We were running the reading group for one year since uh, October last year, so it's going to be like exactly a year since we started, like mm -hmm. our first meeting in uh, ice cream place, <laughs> Ludo and Head. Um, and um, uh, my idea behind this uh, uh, group was to um, actually to create counter-narratives to the existing idea behind how Eastern Europe is usually presented. And sometimes we talk about like this Eastern block image. So my idea was to kind of dismantle this blog or at least install the cracks because all the countries who are like part of this um, yeah, Soviet, post-Soviet space, they have really distinct culture and identities. All of us, we are coming from different countries and different cultural contexts, but what unites us is post-Soviet trauma and also the image existing in the West uh, like how Eastern Bloc look like. Usually it's associated with the block houses or like carpets. And uh, so we just wanted to bring a little bit more complexity. And of course, in order to talk about this problematic, we needed to have some vocabulary. We needed to have some theory to rely on because, yeah, I wanted to research who already working with this topic. And this is how I discovered Madina Tlastanova. She herself uh, coming from the Central Asian uh, background and she uh, lived uh, in Moscow and right now she's like a professor in uh, Sweden. So she lived in an old context being a, a part of the former Soviet uh, colony, Russian colony, 
and uh, lived in Moscow, and she is right now in the West. And she talks a lot about this topic of uh, double colonial difference and how it can be applied to the post-Soviet space. And in our collection, I think there is like one book of her. Uh, it's called What Does It Mean to Be Post-Soviet? And this is a collection of interviews uh, of artists. Actually, I think we have two. Also, post-colonialism and post-socialism in fiction and art. Ah, okay. So this book is, uh, is a collection of interviews uh, of artists who are coming from this uh, post-Soviet background. And again, term post-Soviet is a little bit problematic. I think like there was like also um, uh, like uh, an idea to to say that instead of post-Soviet, maybe we can use former Russian colonies. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, because then it brings, and every colony has their own relationship with empire, their own history of, um, of being a part uh, and experience, because for Estonia, Eva, you told me it's more like an occup occupation, so it's not really like a colony. Oh yeah, it's definitely, an, like it's, it's not a colonial experience since uh, we have like a very, very defined identity of what and who Estonia is. So it's it's really like a rejected idea of having anything to do with Russia or what used to be, which is a problem in itself. Yeah. So this is the point that I'm trying to bring, that um, in Ukraine it was definitely like imperial relationship and then uh, we were part of a, a Soviet uh, space and the history of Poland for example, Patricia can talk about it. It's also a little bit different because Poland became part of the Soviet space after the Second World War. It was also like more like experience of occupation, right? Also, we have, um, I can see we, we have like oh, Ivan Kravtsev and Stephen Holmes, The Light That Failed Us. It's like a new book, uh, which was published like a year ago, but it's a long research uh, about the relationship between Eastern European countries and um, and the West, like game of imitating, uh, because like after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Eastern European countries they just they were completely disenchanted with the communist idea. It was clear that it doesn't work. And then what what is the alternative to communism is capitalism, and it's basically this kind of a new ideal, new utopia that was brought to, to this context. And after, from 1968, right, after 30 years or even more, it's, uh, it's clear that it doesn't work. Like there is a lot of problems with capitalism as well. So, and they both explain pretty well that this is the reason, like disenchantment also with the capitalist ideas is the reason of the raising nationalism in the Eastern Europe. I'm Patricia. Uh, I think I can call myself an alumni. So I graduated from the Rietveld in 2018 and just uh, in May from the Sandberg. Uh, so we still have a graduation uh, show uh, to happen in one month. And uh, I joined the group, I think, half a year ago, just after I finished uh, writing my thesis. And I was very excited to find this collective, because this was what I was missing for the whole study time here in both institutions. This feeling of also being understood by people, not having to explain certain stuff and just talk about the work without kind of explaining the context. And I think in the first meeting, uh, they were generous enough to read my thesis. I wrote about uh, the Madonnas in Poland. So I'm from Poland originally. Yeah, that was a very uh, exciting moment to finally have people to talk about uh, and also finally have a space to share uh, research. Because that was also uh, what I was missing, a place where we can start to research from. Yeah, I was very much uh, lacking that. Uh, so I think that really resembles the work of the group that we brought this, uh, for now, small collection, but I think it's going to grow here. Also, uh, as my graduation work, I uh, created a podcast. It's called Kitchen Conversations, and uh, 
name of the podcast also came from discussions in our group. Vitana Alexievich talks about, one of the authors talks about the kitchen uh, conversation, the kitchen table as being the safe space where you have this informal uh, conversations also common for the Soviet times where people felt safe and also warm because there was heating in kitchens. That's where people gathered and where they talked about life, politics and everything else. And it was supposedly the safe space where uh, the government wasn't listening to you, but this is kind of not so sure. Uh, so yeah, my podcast, Kitchen Conversations, is also one of these platforms which I try to uh, create to to also share these uh, narratives, the sometimes underrepresented voices. And it's uh, me talking to artists, researchers coming from the Eastern Bloc or uh, talking about it in some kind of way. And yeah, I wanted to actually tell you something about two books. This book, uh, it's called The Red Hangover by Kristen Gotzi. And actually this was one of the first books I read, uh, somehow connected to the topics, the themes which we are discussing further in our conversations in the collective. And it's funny because uh, it's by an American writer. That's why I wanted to bring it uh, also today because that's also how she starts this book and her other of her works by precisely stating that she is from, let's say, the other side or like the outsider. And she often gets a lot of critique on that. And she also talks about the fact that everyone is kind of criticized for another reason to talk about, let's say, the post-Soviet or the post-socialistic uh, context because for example me born in 94 so quite some time after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall I'm criticized let's say or judged let's say by my family that I wasn't living through this time so how can I talk about it and uh, exactly people like uh, Christian because they didn't live through it they were on the other side so how can they speak about it and then those who actually lived through it and have certain uh, experiences, traumas connected to it, they are maybe also not uh, able to tell how it really was. But I really appreciate this book because she really, being aware of her position, uh, still discusses it. Uh, she's a professor of Russian and East European Studies in the University of Pennsylvania. So that's already... Yeah. <laughs> and basically the book came out 25 years after the Berlin Wall fell, and she discusses how 25 years after people kind of still experience uh, the differences and how also the, the neoliberalism or the capitalism implemented uh, on the Eastern side is very different and takes a very different form than here. And why that is, I think uh, I really appreciate her voice about that. And the other thing is a journal, a bit more fun thing, a Cayet. Maybe some of you know it, but it's quite, I think, popular at this point. It's uh, based in Bucharest. It's established by uh, two researchers, artists, writers, and it's a combination of art and more theoretical academic uh, inputs. They have already four issues out. Actually, I am very happy that in this upcoming issue uh, my text will appear, so I'm still waiting for my copy, but I think you can already get the fourth issue in Ateneum and in some other bookstores. Yeah, and I think how they work uh, is on an open call, so every every time you can apply with uh, whatever fits to a format of a journal or a paper magazine. They also have a online platform. So they just want to kind of spread the overrepresented, sometimes unheard voices coming more from the periphery of Europe. Thank you, Patricia. I suppose I think uh, it's also like nice to refer from your comment that, that you mentioned about getting feedback from the academy or being able to do research on topics that you yourself can relate to because I think this for me was the biggest motivation in putting energy into meeting with these people because I've never had these discussions that we had, especially in the first months last year 
with pretty much anyone because if I would go back to Estonia and would start talking about it, I think people would be very confused because we all have a very similar understanding of history and a similar understanding of political values and um, a, let's say like a sort of internalized submission to the West that we are reaching for. So I think the first meetings we had were really therapeutic in the sense that the culture shock that we all experienced, or at least I did, is only increasing every year in the Netherlands, just because I understand more and more how different the values actually are and how the capitalist idea that was so very like straight-edgedly applied onto the post-socialist and post-Soviet countries, how it doesn't function because there is no because of many reasons, but there is also no actual relationality to history. It's as if it started completely new. And, and that's, I think, also a contributing factor to why I feel also that I cannot really talk about the trauma, because we somehow all decided that in 1991, the previous history of 50 years has disappeared. And if we don't talk about it, then uh, it didn't happen. And no one really wants to. And yeah, of course, I didn't experience it. And f and for me, for instance, some things really are like elementary. Like I don't really see the deportations to Siberia as something extraordinary or something like, unheard of because everyone had the same experience. But here, people have a sensitivity towards entirely different things. As well as, I think, another thing I've struggled with is the fact that the sort of Eastern European irony or ironic uh, relation ability to any sort of problems that you encounter or like the ability to hate yourself a little bit, uh, just like enough, you know, um, is met with confusion and it's kind of rude in this context. But that's also my personality, I think. And we are trying this year to redefine what we're doing as well and be more open because um, first it was really a therapeutic experience of like together talking to each other and not proving our experiences or our feelings, let's say, to anyone else or needing to explain what we feel to the Western viewer or listener or not even Western, but someone who just has a different experience. But I think now it is important for us to be confident in the fact that we think that this is important and we think that everyone can gain from the complexity and the knowledge of developing a discourse around these histories. And I have learned a lot about all the rest of the Eastern European countries because we also don't learn about each other at school. I know more about France than I know about Lithuania, for instance. And then I was also afraid to really speak as if I had something to say or speak on behalf of a bigger group. But I think that there's power in numbers. So we sort of titled this talk or maybe also our further activities as second thoughts in reference to the term second world in a way, which is the rest of the Europe, let's say, or second thoughts as in rethinking our context or like doubting something that we have internalized. I I think that's my interest in this mainly. And for me, it's not even just about books, but about the fact that this is something that is now like acknowledged, let's say, or that we have realized that it's important. Thank you. Eva, um, I will just add also that uh, like, for me, my, my personal interest was also, of course, not only books, but also uh, visual arts and representation. And uh, one of interest before like starting this group was uh, I constantly met uh, these visuals of, let's say, post-Soviet space, which is kind of ruined porn or uh, like very uh, certain kind of images which were related to, if we say about Belarus, that would be like monuments and war parade. And to me was this kind of misunderstanding like where where I stand in it because I don't see myself represented and um, somehow I felt that I have to work in this kind of aesthetics so 
it was I saw it was accepted in a way in, in I yeah. don't know if you go to galleries you all often see similar visual language related or connected to Eastern Europe and uh, to me it was actually took a lot in uh, uh, post-colonial discourse and um, uh, black diaspora discourse because uh, there was a lot of interesting thoughts which I could relate to and this kind of taking your own power to represent yourself or like to, st uh, to stand and speak for yourself mm -hmm. and decide how you want to be represented and what kind of angles you can open up through your art projects as well, through your research. So um, to me this discussion in, 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 uh, in the group in a setting where people kind of understand or want to listen and, and have sensibility to different histories, it was really like opening and helping me to work with with my own art project. So idea of this group is, not, of course, from one side we are connected through reading, and uh, but we also are artists, we want to create, and, and we exist in a Western context, or like in, we, we're based in Amsterdam, so if we show some work, it's uh, often framed in certain way, so uh, we also work with it, and you know, if knowledge production is kind of a bit more dominant, I would say, in the West. So how do we articulate ourselves? How do we present ourselves? Uh, because I think a lot of artists now, they don't want to be framed in previous, like that it's used to be, like, um, for example, you know, um, I'm coming from Belarus, but I don't necessarily want to talk about dictatorship mm -hmm. or like, I mean, other examples. And also what we figure out in this group that we say, okay, Eastern Bloc, or we reference ourselves as Eastern Bloc, but we also didn't know so much about each other countries. So maybe, you know, some countries share the same past of Soviet history, but yeah, all the countries went completely different paths. So while maybe in Estonia, um, Soviet history was framed as uh, occupation, in Belarus it was um, just framed as part of heroic history. So it's completely different narrative. And if I work with um, how history was taught in Belarus, it's completely different story. And what's happening now in Belarus also related to it. And it's probably then very not understandable for some outsider view. Why is it happening right now in Belarus? Because if you don't divide these countries in uh, having different histories and contexts, that it's looked like one, one you know, piece, but it's actually not. So for us, what we once actually did, we even read um, news from, yeah, from, you know, from, our, from home, from different countries, just to learn about each other. So it's also, um, the idea is to get, educate yourself and don't, you know, don't accept this way of thinking. So, okay, if we're here, we're Eastern Bloc, uh, we actually ask who we are and why is it post-Soviet? Why is it Eastern European? Or maybe it's like, because sometimes, you know, Central European, yeah? yeah. So there are a lot of questions, and is that, that's not where you have answer for these questions. It's more like we want to have space to discuss it. We want to have uh, our voices uh, heard. We want to express it in a safe manner. So that's, I think, how we created this group, and it kind of evolves and develops. And uh, now it's more like community, and we are open to to different kind of events. So and now maybe it would be nice to yeah, talk to with. Open uh, it up a bit. <laughs> yeah to with people with you who came here and uh, to hear your questions or interest and um, yeah in this kind of discussion uh, one more thing that was not uh, mentioned but i think it's really important to uh, like talk about it uh, uh, because like um, the way how eastern europe is presented is not like a personal uh, decision of every artist is more like an institutional thing because in art academies like there is no curriculum talking about this region and like also this was one of the drivers like why we decided to create this group to educate ourselves because we don't know like we we are in the classes we talk about what's happening in the Western Europe or like what is happening in the United States, but we yeah. ha never talk about yeah. uh, the context from which we came uh, from. And another thing is um, that also like the museums, uh, like which projects they support. Uh, my personal interest was like researching like how museum archives present like these identities. And I was specifically focusing on Ukrainian identity because I'm Ukrainian myself. So you can um, always see that in academia, for example, there is like this Soviet studies uh, that were like this department was formed during the Cold War and uh, it's turned like it's changed to Slavic uh, studies or like uh, 
um, yeah, it's almost equal to Russian, uh, Russian and Slavic studies, and then uh, everything which used to be Soviet, it's uh, became Russian, and Russia still has a, a war conflicts with countries like Georgia and uh, Ukraine, and um, it, like this setup in academia uh, helps to propagate imperial, new imperial threat mm -hmm. uh, coming from Russia, which is like really problematic. You can see in museums, big museums like Stedelijk, for example, uh, how um, artists uh, from Belarus, Ukraine are presented as Russian artists. Like I did project for Uncut exhibition in Rietveld about the work of Dzigavertov and a poster written in Ukrainian language was presented um, to uh, yeah, pro promote an uh, exhibition about Russian film art. And this specific movie was about region Donbass in 30s. But right now in this uh, region, there is a war conflict with Russia. So it's really problematic when in 2018, Stedelijk Museum shows the, um, uh, like the, this work as Russian because it means that they made, they took their side, you know, uh, but maybe it's not because they made this decision, it's out of in ignorance. So I think like decolonization of this narrative should happen also in the museum's archives in the West. And this is really important and in the academia as well. We should address it. I can share a couple of experiences, I suppose. Like for instance, a colleague uh, from this academy who is uh, from the Western section for quite some time greeted me every time with, hey, Tavarish, Ruski, Ruski, which means like, hey, comrade, uh, Russia, Russia, or Russian. And every time I was like, well, yeah, but I'm not really, like, it's not really nice. Like, you don't call other Germans Nazis. Please don't really call me a communist because it's an, it's an insult and it's like very contextualized, as well as Estonia and Russia really are not, you know, you, you can't make that joke. Uh, but that person's excuse was that they had a close uh, relationship with a Russian woman, uh, so they are allowed to do this. And I mean, I understand that having like relations to people from different parts of the world can give you more knowledge about that context. But then I think you should also be able to question, like, what is your position in reinstituting jokes maybe that are very contextual? They don't make that joke anymore. But it was quite like a, a conflict at some point. But this summer we actually talked about this uh, through Facebook. Mm. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, th there's just, you know, uh, a meme page. And a meme page can nowadays be a community as well. It's like a socialist meme page, and they're constantly using the word comrades as well. And yeah. uh, I don't know. They're very open to having people comment and uh, tell them, like, maybe you should not. I don't know. We had a discussion about it. But I was actually wondering, because I see a book that I have, but I didn't read the third issue of Kayet. And I was wondering if maybe... Yeah, because it's, uh, for me, it's too much to read all. If maybe people have read it and had some uh, recommendations, I don't know. Like, uh, just uh, if people had highlights. In so. this one, I think, like, there is a really nice, uh, there is a really nice uh, project about um, a photographer uh, cleaning the monuments. Yeah, I think like like this is because this uh, journal is also like it's not only text. It's the the idea behind it that there is like an academic text meet uh, art, um, and also like you can see sometimes it's just uh, like an art uh, project and um, and also like theory next to it. Um, so I'm just looking. I'm looking for it. <laughs> Yeah, so I really loved like this project with cleaning the monuments as the way to also talk about the labor and like the role of women in in uh, in this space. And um, you know, it's uh, it's also a little bit like a useless uh, thing to do to clean the to clean the monument and also like to think about to think about the monument is like there is like a big discussion going on in our in our. 
space because you know in some countries there is uh, like decommunization process going on so we are like completely dismantling the um, monuments of Lenin and um, Stalin and like there is like renaming the streets and in some countries actually the, it's still there like one of our group members Misho Antanze he made the whole movie about uh, city Gori in Georgia uh, where they still have museum of Stalin and uh, like a lot of Stalin monuments in, in the city and uh, because this is the city where Stalin was originally born. So, and like, what does it mean for the city to like actually remove it because they kind of get used to it. It's, it's the part of the identity. There is a Stalin impersonator walking down the streets, <laughs> you know. So it's a really weird. Um, you can actually still see like the movie because it's available on the Film Academy page, uh, and it's really nice atmospheric because Michaud brings the complexity to this topic. You cannot simply just remove the sculpture because we have to go back in past and think about this trauma and have a conversation about it because it will not go away because there is still all the generation of people who live with this trauma and they associate themselves being a Soviet yeah, and there are a lot of people like this. So it's not that simple, it's really nuanced and complex and we have to yeah, embrace this complexity. Yeah, yeah I wanted to also, um, in relation to what we were talking about, the language and calling each other comrades in like Western leftist spaces, I think also just calling yourself communist is very common and uh, to be honest studying in the Sandberg I think more than 50% of my teachers or people who are coming like the first thing they were sharing is that they are communists even in the email signage some I heard I didn't see it but no, some people put that. the graphics of the communist uh, logo uh, so I think yeah just this already kind of tells how you just throw these things without even thinking that for someone else, like for example, my parents, if they hear the, that there is a communist somewhere that really triggers something. So I think this in a space like the Sandberg, even there, it's not kind of even considered to be problematic in any way. It's already telling us a bit of how certain things maybe need a bit of processing. Mm. But it's all how it's possible that this is not like a problematic because I do think that there's a lot of people from Eastern Europe in the, the academy and, you know, like taking part in the programs, but somehow you don't feel like you could pick up or you don't feel like this is the spot where, I mean, I personally at least found it quite difficult to like say that, hey, but uh, maybe let's talk about this or that, that a theory teacher who is American would decide that they would have to give a lesson on the Second World War uh, to a class where more than half of the students are post-Soviet countries and using terms such as the countries east from the Berlin Wall decided to side with the USSR, you know? I, it's difficult to like even address something so odd somehow. Yeah, but I think it's kind of part of this group that we're trying to talk about it and also just to see the connection, right? Because like I wanted to make example, like, I was at talk of Ivan Krastev in the Bali and I was surprised uh, how he managed to kind of connect because we, we often speak about East and West and uh, but they of course of course it's it's existing in, in in relation to each other and uh, like one of ideas also of the group was just to be more confident to speak about histories and also in connection because in a way we st sometimes i feel like we still like you know with the eastern european background it's almost like we we are there but actually we are here we get an uh, western education and we influenced by it also w like we try sometimes to make some talks or certain things we, which we can see in relation. So it's not like, you know, just, let's say, uh, separately, uh, mm -hmm. like communism or, but all the politics like involved. Yeah. And it's, um, I think it's, it can be like a kind of bridging point where it's not excluded. It's not like one side and another, but it coexists in relation to each other. Yeah. And I thought like when I was at, uh, it's really like, 
it was nice talk of uh, Ivan Krasov when, when he managed and he managed somehow to make jokes and and connect and and relate to to local um, mm. context and be able to. So we have kind of some connection. It's it's possible to dig in. Um, yeah. And I think uh, it's a very approachable uh, text in that sense. Yeah, and we try to collect most of the books are, m let's say, yeah, more like readable and approachable. Also, wonderful b books by uh, Tlastanova. Like to me, it was really eye-opening uh, books. I don't mm. know, especially. I mean, it was a bit different situation by, back then with Belarus. So I felt like it was really, I don't know, boring country. <laughs> and then um, now, yeah, it's like a lot of my research, which was relevant, but now become even more relevant. And it's all kind of started with certain books from here. Yeah. So I don't know if you have uh, any more questions or comments. Can... Yeah. I'm thinking about like strategies to how, um, yeah, uh, like infiltrate institutions and museums, like how, is it possible to actually go into their archives and change things? Because they tend to act really stupid, uh, <laughs> while we call it ignorant, but it actually kind of bit stupid. Yeah, and I have another thought as well. Um, I was thinking about also the comparison between capitalism and communism. And it kind of seems, I feel like a lot of people in the West and also in other places, uh, they kind of have this comparison. So because of the frustration of capitalism, so you kind of go to mm -hmm. the other option mm -hmm. as if it's like the only option. So I also thought, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm actually quite interested in this. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you are a Western person who is interested in options or interested in communism, maybe you should speak to Eastern European people and Chinese people <laughs> and not... Good point. Not post on a meme page? First thing about the first question about the archives, uh, there is a possibility by creating um, more complex image, like images of the, like talking, like we as I believe that artists have the possibility to create uh, new audiences uh, with our art practices. And like this reading group is one of the examples of the of this practice to, like, today we met, we talk about it, and you came with a different idea that you, you were before. So it's, it's also a possibility to, uh, create new narratives like this specific practice, but also it can be a movie or a painting, but uh, participating in the exhibitions and uh, creating more complex counter narratives to the existing one. And like with my experience with Stadelik, um, I could say that I had a conversation with the, uh, Frank van Lumen, who is like researcher and he specializes in the Russian art. And, uh, he was open and he, um, like, kind of agreed on the fact that he is, uh, the, when they were making this exhibition, they were like ignorant. So, but to get to this conversation, I have to be, part of the uncut exhibition because I tried to contact them before and it was not possible through social media or like I was even writing emails to the um, uh, to the study lake directly but no one responded to me so yeah this is not so transparent and this is also something we have to talk about and and second question about communism versus capitalism I do believe this is a false dichotomy because um, it's not like Cold War, <laughs> yeah, cold, after Cold War, <laughs> com communist lost and uh, like capitalist won and this is like the only existing structure. We don't have to think in black and white and I think we can learn from both systems because somehow communist st structure always leads to the authoritarian state for some reason and this is like the big prob problem with it. But there are like really uh, amazing ideas about like being together in the community and um, and working together for the for the common goal. And this concept of comradeship, it's not an invention of the communists. Actually, the term itself it was uh, invention of the French Revolution, and comrade means people who live in the same room. Uh, so it's from the word like chamber. And 
uh, yeah, so I think like communists, they just appropriated it. And also depending on the context, the meaning of the word comrade is different here in the West. Yeah, but on the other hand, we are right now forced to discuss this entire topic in English, uh, which is none of our first languages, and it doesn't really like serve the purpose of talking about our histories. Uh, so it's, uh, yes, it's a tool for us to communicate to each other because I don't speak really any other languages that are around our country, you know. Mm -hmm. But then it's also like a, a weapon and uh, the word comrade is, this This is what it is in English, but in Russian it's another word. In, an, British, in Estonian yeah. it's a completely different word, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is very directly in the context of... This the is another complex part of it because comrade, uh, this is like Hollywood actually translation of the, I think, this is like a production of the Hollywood, like the depicting Russians, mafia, and they mm. always call each other comrades. I think this is how pe most of the people <laughs> <laughs> familiar with the term. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, well, and, and the Estonians are always whores in, in films, in American oh, yeah, uh, representation absolutely. and so on, but we don't have to, you know, eat into it. Yeah. So I think it's uh, there is always like more complexity and just looking at it, just communism versus capitalism, it's a little bit too simple. And uh, I think both of the systems, they are like very heavily based on the Western modernity, uh, which means like the industrialization and all this, um, the, the darker side of modernity, which is the coloniality. Because all this colonial relationship is also like they were there, like in the Soviet Russia. So it's like all these problems that you encounter with the capitalism, they're also really present in the communist states, even worse, because you don't have like a freedom of speech and there is only one truth which is tell, like told by the party. And if you do not uh, fit into this uh, ideal, then the state will just destroy you because you are just uh, like an obstacle for the, yeah. for the utopia to be true. And this is the also like, yeah, I can talk a lot about questions. Um, so I'm quite interested in um, the idea of the diaspora, actually, maybe also because I was four years old when I came to the Netherlands. So that is, my experience is completely like um, embedded in the diaspora. And, um, and um, before there was some talk about meme pages and maybe also Western people uh, posting on these meme pages and so on and using certain words. But what I got interested in is um, there's these meme pages of Eastern Europeans from the diaspora that use these pages or that use memes to kind of create a, maybe a stereotypical self-mockery of certain mm -hmm. visual elements in which I think they're also finding a shared experience. Like, you know, all the grandmothers that are CCTV or the vodka, rakia, whatever drink that is the medicine for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm really curious about how, what you think about this combination maybe between a romanticization of the stereotypes, but in a way from, maybe not from the inside, because it's used a lot in the diaspora, but at least as a, a stereotype which is not created by people from the West that have this one, um, one-sided one vision of what Eastern Europe is, but yeah, as a romanticization or as a shared um, uh, visual language, I think, that also crosses all these differences which you were talking about before, because, for example, I am from ex-Yugoslavia, which is a quite different history than the ones that you know were addressed here, and then at the same time, through these memes, you see so many similarities. So, I don't know. Have you talked about that or how do you feel about that? You've mentioned a lot of things, but I also find it like funny to like think about, uh, for instance, what kind of history r remains with your parents once they leave and bring you along and what they remember as like the cultural experience versus what some other people might experience and, you know, like what what do your parents or what does the older generation decide to remember or what to joke on? And there's also like an, I think the, the ironic uh, position that you mentioned is, is a good point. And there's a, an interview with an artist uh, called uh, Lina Sieb from Estonia and uh, Tlastanova. She, she has also like speculated on her 
ironical position and the problematics of it. And um, she speculates that maybe the bitter truth is easier to convey through humor or satire, and maybe it's an inseparable part of me as a post-socialist subject. As people who have lived, lived under totalitarian regimes acquire a bread-in-the-bone irony as part of their survival strategy. There is a problem with irony. It somehow offers a safe position, a safe distance between the subject and the audience, and it confirms the existing patterns. And I think that's the case with a lot of these meme pages, that like we ourselves are also guilty of putting us in the position in a way, if you know what I mean. Um, I was thinking how it's interesting that, like, I mean, I'm from Peru, from Latin America, completely different context, completely... You know, we also have communists, or so-called, <laughs> anywho. So I think that the reason why all of these meme pages are emerging around the world uh, regarding, like, people who are, like, repatriated or expatriated for whatever reason, if it's, like... I think it's a calling that people in our vernacular or our age are seeking to be more informed about this, you know? Like, satire has been long known to be this thing we rest on rest our like heads you know and irony and like you know being passive aggressive to like people around you or just kind of being like you know a deadpan mm -hmm. and having some sort of like black humor mm -hmm. like they call it you know so I think it's also very important to go back to I think what Hala said that like how do we maybe shift this satire into you know something that could be more productive to like find ourselves again in like our identities or our fractionalized identities, you know? And I, I think that these types of like gatherings or encounters, even if it's like not from like, you know, in the form of a library talk, you know? Because sometimes when you make work, at least I'm in fine arts, for instance, and it's a studio-based practice, and it can be very lonely, you know? And it can be very like narcissistic, and it's sometimes like, it closes down like the borders in which you like actually share your work because it's something that's really yours, you know? So you don't really want to like expose yourself to these things, no? So like I have found that the academic ground is a place where like I can like, you know, be a bit more chill about stuff because maybe sometimes your artistic practice can be too private, you know? Mm -hmm. So I also feel like in order to understand your work better, it's also good to like stand on like an academic or a research, let's call it research, because academic is like a, mm -hmm. another truculent word. Um, yeah, I wanted to add also like about uh, on, on the topic about like satire and joking. I think, um, I mean, I think like iron, this like very specific kind of like irony and like humor has been like a very big part of like, I mean, I'm from Russia. So like, I would say like, I, I talk about the history I know. Um, and especially like Russian art history, because that is very, I mean, also like as a general like, human mechanism, but I think it's a very like common strategy to cope with things, uh, that are actually like very like intense to talk about on a serious note, and especially in like the Russian history and like, um, art history, uh, kind of, there's a lot of this note, there are a lot of this like humorous tone in art about like the regime because that if you work under the censorship, there's also like that is the only way that you can actually like address things because maybe then it will come through and that is actually like a way to, yeah, like point out the problem because you are either afraid or not able to talk about it seriously because of whatever reason. And I think, I mean, it is still very much the case, and that is also why how it comes through in our, like, or, like, say, in my character of, like, yeah, sometimes instead of, like, addressing the problem of just, like, coming through with a joke about it mm -hmm. instead of actually, like, talking to people about this as, like, this is actually a mm -hmm. serious problem, it worries me. And I think, like, again, coming back to the importance of, like, what this, like, what is happening here right now is like trying to go past this this point of like meme pages or this like ironic jokes because even like when we say like joke in this way to each other about these things sometimes even like if we can like people that can share more of this context even we don't like really go past that yeah so just the importance of 
going past this like whatever it is like shield and actually like addressing the problem because we have a like a platform and possibility for it and a lot of other people don't and yeah, yeah. so like what's the i don't know what what would you I, I just think that like one of many ways into like maybe not staying in the in the in the stratosphere of irony mm -hmm. is just like showing up mm -hmm. in in what whatever way it is you know it's like just come through you know yeah. like like you guys came through and it's really nice you know <laughs> And it doesn't have to be serious, and it doesn't have to have like a lot of purpose, and, you know. No, yeah, it doesn't have to be like policing people or like uh, telling uh, others that uh, they're thinking wrong things about communism. I mean, yeah, I mean, you don't have to be chill about it. Also, you know, I feel like I, I, I don't know, like to an when extent, you when you like want to scream at someone in their face, you should just do no, it. No, but the, like, then I mean, there is the problem. Of, sorry, <laughs> there is the problem of like as soon as you accuse someone of some something or as soon as emotionality comes to play in a discussion the other person stops listening and acts on the feeling you know in my opinion at least i was just thinking that maybe there's yeah? a way to okay. solve okay. this and to make two communisms like the fantasy communism <laughs> And the embodied lived experience, and then everyone can be happy. Maybe we and could we will call know them that different. we're talking about different things. You guys yeah, know? good point. Yeah. We're going to start a meme page. <laughs> but we, had, we actually had the idea that we can not only, uh, you know, make like really reading sessions, but also something more embodied like theater play. Yeah, or like where, political theater. Yeah, almost. political theater play. Like and satire. It could be, yeah, it could be fun, but also could be a way to talk about a different way. Or like, Yeah. But that's a complicated thing yeah. to approach us. <laughs> but yeah, we have some plans for for coming. So, so that Do you we know. Until, uh, th yeah. like a so we have a um, next event. So we have twenty third of October. What we plan to have like a monthly meetup where we can read some text and discuss, but also hang out and talk about anything. What is the text that we're reading for next time? I think we were thinking about this book, Twilight of Democracy. Yeah. But yeah, if everyone is, I think up so for too. It, <laughs> they don't have a choice. <laughs> I wanted to read this book a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and then we wanted uh, to make a panel discussion. Uh, I mean, so I wanted uh, to share like um, the history, not the history, but yeah, what role art played in the Belarusian protest. Mm -hmm. And we, because it's also like a lot of unrest in many countries actually around uh, Eastern Europe. So it would be nice to see uh, maybe in comparison. So we have one uh, artist. Uh, uh, from Bulgaria, so we could we potentially thinking about comparing because Bulgaria part of EU, mm -hmm. Belarus not, but uh, in a way how European Union react toward it uh, mm -hmm. or not react. Uh, it's also a lot of interesting things, but um, it's like for now it's a open topic, but we will clarify it. Yeah, it w it's basically aiming on what you mentioned before about uh, like putting things in connection to each other and contextualizing and understanding that everything is tight uh, yeah. and you know there's not two Europe's but they're yeah. intertwined yeah definitely um, so if you want uh, to join or you, you, we are all also open to suggestions so if you have some book to read or some informal conversation or I don't know cinema <laughs> exhibition whatever so we, we have a Facebook group yeah we, we can post it under the event page yeah perhaps yeah let's see what happened with uh, Restriction and COVID before we had also online meet meetups, so maybe it would be easier sometimes to do it online. Yeah, but also. for uh, November we have the gym, so I think we can fit in there. Yeah, we have gym and <laughs> we get money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you to the student council for funding us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think Should we wrap up? Yeah, official part is over, but I mean we can. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, share with you an exhibition which is happening now in Frame or Framed. Some of you might know it, a space in the east of Amsterdam. And there's a really great exhibition about the Srebrenica genocide, which happened 25 years ago. And there is, uh, I think, seven artists coming together to talk about uh, yeah, the topic of uh, genocide in general, specifically this uh, uh, genocide uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, how it relates to Dutch history actually. So it's very interesting, very relevant also to place where we live, I think, all of us. So I recommend, I think it's till January or something like that. 
No, I think just the, the monument in front is oh, okay. two more weeks and then the inside exhibition is for longer. Yeah. But yeah, two more weeks for the installation in front, which is amazing. So, yeah, I have a bike right there. I also make exhibition uh, <laughs> on uh, this Sunday in Utrecht, which related to yeah, protests in Belarus and going to showcase some of the posters and uh, also examples of self-organization in uh, neighborhoods which appeared in Belarus. So if someone from Utrecht, you can join. Uh, it will be in Peron West this Sunday. For one day only, but I also uh, there might be also exhibition in Arti in Amsterdam later in uh, in the end of October. So I will definitely when it's more set up and so there is uh, some plans. Uh, so we'll try to announce yeah. in a group if there are. And you are also welcome to share if if you make some sort of yeah. events. So. And uh, book recommendations to Peter. Uh, yeah, maybe nice if you if you want to because we have an email. Subscribe, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you want to get in touch, we also have emails here. Or <laughs> we're gonna have posters and posts. Yeah. We're just developing the concept still. Yeah. 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 So we're next time our still. kitchen conversation, more like informal setup and reading group, twenty third of October. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Peter for hosting us. Oh yeah, thank you to Fernanda and uh, Oliver and Radio Retail. Uh, and yeah, thank you Peru to Potatoes.